The Art of Dying Well by St. Robert Bellarmine Chapter 7 The Seventh Precept, which is on Prayer Hitherto we have spoken on the precepts of dying well, taken from the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, and also we have spoken on the three moral virtues, sobriety, justice, and piety, all of which the blessed Apostle Paul recommends to us. I will now add another precept on the three good works, prayer, fasting, and alms deeds, which we learn from the angel Raphael. We read in the book of Tobit that the angel Raphael thus spoke, Prayer is good with fasting and alms, more than the lay-up treasures of gold. These three good works are the fruit of the virtues of religion, mercy, and temperance, which have a great affinity with piety, justice, and sobriety. For as piety regards God, justice our neighbor, and sobriety ourselves, so also prayer, which is an act of religion, regards God, alms deeds, which is an act of mercy, regards our neighbor, and fasting, which is an act of abstinence, regards ourselves. Of prayer may be written much, but according to the nature of our treatise we will only dwell on three points. The necessity of prayer, the advantage of it, and the method of praying with advantage. The necessity of prayer is so often insisted upon in the Holy Scripture that nothing is more clearly commanded than this duty. For although the Almighty knows what we stand in need of, as our Lord Himself tells us in St. Matthew, yet He wishes that we should ask for what we require, and by prayer lay hold of it, as if by spiritual hands or some suitable instrument. Hear our Lord in St. Luke, that we ought always to pray and not to faint, and also, watch ye therefore, praying at all times. Chapter 18 and Chapter 21 Hear the Apostle, pray without ceasing. And Ecclesiasticus, let nothing hinder thee from praying always. Chapter 18 these precepts do not signify that we should do nothing else, but only that we should never forget so wholesome an exercise, and should frequently make use of it. This is what our Lord and His Apostles have taught us, for they did not always pray in such a manner as to neglect preaching to the people and confirming their words by signs and wonders. And yet it might be said that they always were praying, because they prayed fre very frequently. In this sense must be understood these words. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, and also His praise shall always be in my mouth. And the words concerning the Apostle. And they were always in the temple, praising and blessing God. But the fruits of prayer are three especial advantages, merit, satisfaction, and impetration. On the merit of prayer we have the testimony of Christ himself in the gospel. And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites that love to stand and pray in the synagogues and corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. But thou, when thou shalt pray, enter into thy chamber, and having shut the doors, pray to thy Father in secret, and thy Father who seeth, seeth in secret shall repay thee. 
St. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. By these words our Lord does not forbid us from praying in a public place, for he himself prayed publicly before he raised Lazarus. But he forbids public prayer when it is done that we may be seen praying by others, and this through vainglory. Otherwise we may pray in the temple, and there find a chamber for our heart, and in it pray to God in secret. The words, will repay thee, signify the merit, for as he said of the Pharisee, he has received his reward, that is, human praise, so of one who prays in the chamber of his heart, and who looks to God alone, we must understand that to him will be given a reward by his Father who seeth in secret. Respecting satisfaction for past sins, we all know the practice of the Church, by which, when satisfaction is enjoined, prayer is united with fasting and alms. Nay, very often alms and fasting are omitted, and prayer alone commanded. In fine, that prayer can obtain many gifts St. John Chrysostom beautifully teaches us in his two books on prayer, in which he employs the comparison of the human hands. For, as man is born naked and helpless, and in want of all things, and yet cannot complain of his Creator, because he has given him hands, which are the organ of organs, and by which man is enabled to provide for himself food, garments, house, etc. So also the spiritual man can do nothing without the divine assistance. But man possesses the power of prayer, the organ of all spiritual organs, whereby he can easily provide for himself all things. Besides these three primary advantages of prayer, there are also many others. For in the first place, Prayer enlightens the mind. Man cannot directly fix the eye of his soul upon God, who is the light, without being enlightened by Him. Come ye to Him, and be enlightened, saith David. Secondly, prayer nourishes our hope and confidence. For the oftener we speak with another, the more confidently do we approach Him. Thirdly, it inflames our charity, and makes our soul more capable of receiving the greater gifts, as St. Augustine affirms. Fourthly, it increases humility and chaste fear, for he who goes to prayer acknowledges that he is a beggar before God, and therefore humbles himself before him, and is most careful not to offend him of whom is assistance, he stands in need of everything. Fifthly, prayer produces in our mind a contempt of all earthly goods, for all temporal objects must appear mean and contemptible in the eyes of him who continually meditates on things spiritual and eternal. See St. Augustine Book 9 of the Confessions. Sixthly, prayer gives us incredible delight, since by it we begin to taste how sweet is the Lord. And how great this sweetness is, we may understand from this circumstance alone, that some, I have known, pass not only nights, but even whole days and nights in prayer without any trouble or inconvenience. In fine, besides the utility and the pleasure, prayer also adds dignity and honor to us. For even the angels themselves honor that soul, which they see is so often and familiarly admitted to speak with the Divine Majesty. We will now speak 
on the method of praying well, in which chiefly consists the art of living well, and consequently the art of dying well. For what our Lord says, Ask, and it shall be given to you, for every one that asks receives. St. James, in his epistle, declares it to be understood with the condition, If we ask properly, you ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss. Chapter 4 We may reason, then, as follows. He who properly asks for the gift of living well will doubtless receive it, and he who properly asks for perseverance in a good life until death, and by this a happy death also, will certainly obtain it. We will, therefore, briefly explain the conditions of prayer, that so we may learn how to pray well, live well, and die well. The first condition is faith, according to the words of the Apostle. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And with this St. James agrees, Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. But this necessity of faith is not so to be understood as if it were necessary to believe that God would certainly grant what we ask. For thus our faith would often prove false, and we should, therefore, obtain nothing. We must believe, then, that God is most powerful, most wise, most high, and most faithful, and therefore that He knows and that he can, and is prepared to do what we beg of him, if he shall think proper, and if it be expedient for us to receive what we ask. This faith Christ required of the two blind men who desired to be cured. Do you believe that I can do this unto you? With the same faith did David pray for his sick son, for his words prove that he believed not for certain that God would grant his request, but only that he could grant it. Who knows whether the Lord may not give him to me, and the child may live? It cannot be doubted, but that with the same faith the Apostle Paul prayed to be delivered from the sting of the flesh. Since he prayed with faith, and his faith would have been false if he believed that God would certainly grant what at that time he asked, for he did not then obtain his request. And with the same faith does the Church pray that all heretics, pagans, schismatics, and bad Christians may be converted to penance. And yet it is certain that they are not all converted concerning which matter, consult St. Prosper in his books on the vocation, calling, of the Gentiles. Another condition of prayer, and that a very necessary one, is hope or confidence. For although we must not by faith, which is a work of the understanding, imagine that God will certainly grant our requests, Yet by hope, which is an act of the will, we may firmly rely upon the divine goodness and certainly hope that God will give us what we asked for. This condition our Lord required of the paralytic, to whom he said, Be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. The same the apostle requires of all, when he says, Let us go therefore with confidence to the throne of grace. And long before him, the prophet thus introduces God, saying, Because he has hoped in me, I will deliver him. But because hope springs from perfect faith, therefore when scripture requires faith in great things, it adds something regarding hope. 
Hence we read in St. Mark, Amen, I say to you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall not stagger in his heart, but believe that whatever he says shall be done, it shall be done unto him. Of which faith-producing confidence are to be understood the words of the Apostle, if I should have all faith so that I could move mountains, etc. Hence John Cashin writes in his treatise on prayer that it is a certain sign of our request being granted when in prayer we hope that God will certainly give us what we ask, and when in our petitions we do not in any way hesitate, but pour forth in prayers with spiritual joy. A third condition is charity, or justice, by which we are delivered from our sins. For none but the friends of God obtain the gifts of God. Thus David speaks in the Psalms, The eyes of the Lord are upon the just, and his ears unto their prayers. And in another place, If I have looked at iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And in the New Testament our Lord himself says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, my precepts, you shall ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done unto you. And the beloved disciple says, Dearly beloved, if our heart does not reprehend us, we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we shall ask, we shall receive of him. Because we keep his commandments, and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. First Epistle of St. John, chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. This is not contrary to the doctrine that when the publican asked of God the forgiveness of sins, he returned home justified for a penitent sinner does not obtain his request as a sinner, but as a penitent. For as a sinner he is the enemy of God, as a penitent the friend of God. He that commits sin does what is not pleasing to God, but he who repents of his sins does what is most pleasing to him. A fourth condition is humility by which he that prays confides not in his own justice, but in the goodness of God. But to whom shall I have respect, but to him that is poor and little, and of a contrite spirit, and that trembleth at my words? Isaiah chapter 56 verse 2 And Sirach adds, the prayer of him that humbleth himself shall pierce the clouds, and till it come nigh he will not be comforted, and he will not depart till the Most High behold. Chapter 35, verse 21 A fifth condition is devotion, by which we pray not negligently, as many are accustomed to do, but with attention earnestness, diligence, and fervor. Our Lord severely blames those that pray with their lips only. Thus he speaks by Isaiah, This people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips glorify me, but their heart is far from me. Chapter 29, verse 13 this virtue springs from a lively faith, and consists not in habit alone, but in deed. For he who attentively and with a firm faith considers how great is the majesty of God, how great our nothingness, and how important those things are that we ask for, he cannot possibly help praying with the greatest humility reverence, devotion, and fervor. 
we shall hear add powerful testimonies from two of the Holy Fathers. St. Jerome, in his Dialogues Against the Luciferians, says, I commence prayer. I should not pray if I did not believe. But if I had true faith, this heart which God sees I would cleanse. I would strike my breast. I would water my cheeks with my tears. I would neglect all attention to my body and become pale. I would throw myself at the feet of my Lord and wash them with my weeping and wipe them with my hair. I would clasp the cross and not depart before I had obtained mercy. Now, most frequently during my prayers, I am walking either along the porticos or I am counting my usury or being carried away by evil thought. I entertain those things which it is shameful to speak of. Where is our faith? Do we suppose that Jonah prayed thus? The three children in the fire? Daniel in the lion's den? Or the good thief on the cross? St. Bernard, in his sermon on the four methods of praying, thus writes, It especially behooves us during the time of prayer to enter the heavenly chamber, that chamber, I mean, in which the King of Kings sits on his royal throne, surrounded by an innumerable and glorious army of blessed spirits. With what reverence, then, with what fear, with what humility, ought dust and ashes to approach, we who are nothing but vile, creeping insects, with what trembling, earnestness, care, and solicitude, ought miserable man to stand before the divine majesty in the presence of the angels in the assembly of the just. In all our actions, then, we have much need of vigilance, especially in prayer. The sixth condition is perseverance which our Lord in two parables has recommended in St. Luke. The first is concerning him who went in the night to a friend to ask for the loan of a few loaves, who being refused because of the unseasonable hour, yet by perseverance obtained his request. St. Luke chapter 11 the second is concerning the widow who besought the judge to free her from her adversary. And the judge, although a very bad man, and one that feared neither God nor man, yet being overcome by the perseverance and importunity of the woman, he delivered her from her adversary. From these examples our Lord concludes that much more ought we to persevere in prayer to God because he is just and merciful. And as St. James adds, He gives to all abundantly, and does not upbraid. That is, he gives liberally to all who ask his gifts, and he does not upbraid their importunity, should they be too troublesome in their importunities. For God has no measure in his riches, nor in his mercy. St. Augustine, in his explanation of the last verse of Psalm 65, adds these words, If thou shalt see that thy prayer is not rejected, thou art secure, because his mercy is not removed from thee. End of chapter 7